58 minutes um, to talk about digital signatures, finite fields, ECDSA, Schnorr signatures. Um, that's a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to go quite quickly, and I'm going to go at it from a very high level. Um, my name is John. I live in New York. I work at a company called Chaincode Labs, and most of the time I contribute to Bitcoin Core. So I'm going to talk about the concept of electronic coins and how digital signatures fit into that. I'm going to talk about finite fields, elliptic curves, and then Schnorr signatures. And then I'll very quickly touch ECDSA. So you might be wondering why I'm talking about Schnorr signatures more than ECDSA. Um, Schnorr signatures are easier to understand, easier to reason about, and they should give you the intuition about how digital signatures work. Um, like I said, there's, there's quite a lot in all of that. I'm not going to go into great detail in many of those things, and I'm hoping you'll come away from this with a bit of an intuition about how this all fits together. You can treat some of these things like a black box. So if you understand the properties of how digital signatures work, you don't necessarily need to know the structure underneath as long as you understand the properties that give it that we need from um, a, a finite field or a group. Um, and then I'll point you in the direction of some further reading. OK, so some warnings. I'm not a cryptologist. This is only an overview. There's not going to be any formal proofs. There's not going to be any code. There's not going to be many mathematical formulas. And I'm going to use some terms loosely. So any cryptologists in the room, I apologize. I'm going to say things like zero knowledge instead of honest verifier zero knowledge, and things like proof instead of argument. OK, electronic coins. This is an extract from a document. Does anyone recognize which document this is from? Yeah, OK, this is section two of the Bitcoin white paper describing what an electronic coin is. So we define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by digitally signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding these to the end of the coin. A payee can verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. So each transaction, this is transaction one, um, it contains the public key of who now owns the coin, and it contains a signature of who owned the coin previously. And then next in the chain, owner one signs using his private key, has a hash of the previous transaction, and includes the public key of who he wants to pass the coin to. So a transaction consists of, and this is very simplified, one or more inputs. So those are coins going into the transaction. And those inputs contain a reference to the output of the previous transaction. And a digital signature, which proves that the person creating that transaction actually owns the coin and authorizes a transfer. And then the transaction also contains some outputs, which contain the amount of coin going to that output and the public key of the recipient. OK, so it goes from one person or one public key to the next public key. OK, in practice, it's a bit more complex than that. We have scripts and various different kinds of transaction, but this is a very simplified view of a system that works or would work like Bitcoin. Um, so how do we verify that transaction? Well, every node on the network checks that the inputs point to a, an output that exists and has not been spent. Check that the total amount of the inputs or the outputs do not exceed the amounts of the inputs. And that each input contains a valid signature. In practice, again, there's a lot more going on. But from a very high level, a simplified level, this is what happens when you verify a transaction. So what is a digital signature? Well, they're used to transfer the ownership of coins, and it proves that the owner of the coin, the person who, who owns the coin, authorized the transfer. Only someone with the private key can create a transaction. We call that authentication. And once that person is signed with the private key, no one else can change the transaction after it's been signed, and that's called integrity. What is it? Well, digital signatures make use of a concept called asymmetric cryptography. There's a public key which is known to everyone in the world. That's why it's public. And there's a corresponding private key, which is kept secret. Only someone with the private key 
can create a valid signature over the message. And anyone with a public key can verify that that signature is true and valid. How do we use that in Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin uses a digital signature scheme called ECDSA, and that goes over a, an elliptic curve called SECP256K1. ECDSA ECDS is a little bit of a hack. It's um, to get around a patent that was granted to the inventor of the Schnorr signature algorithm. Um, Schnorr is better in, in almost every way. And in the future, we may extend the Bitcoin protocol to also allow Schnorr signatures. I'm going to talk about something called the discrete log problem. ECDSA and, and Schnorr are applications of this problem we call the discrete log problem. And very simply put, that means that in some systems, it's easy to multiply, but difficult to divide. And when I say multiply, I mean take an element in that system and add it to itself many times. Okay, we can, we can do that quite easily. But if I give you two elements and I say, how many times do I need to add the first element to the, get to the second element? We can call that division in quotes. That's very difficult. So that that asymmetry between being able to multiply easily but not being able to divide is how is what's called the discrete log problem. And on top of that, we can build a digital signature scheme. I'm going to talk about cyclic groups in a second. Um, but very briefly, if we talk about a cyclic group with a generator G, the problem is for a different element in that group, what is the scalar X? such that if you add G to itself X times, you end up with H, right? This XG, adding G to itself many times, that's easy, we can do that. But given H, it's very difficult to work out what X is. And in our public key cryptography scheme, X is a private key and H is a public key. Um, Bitcoin, that system that we're talking about where we can add things but or, or multiply things but not divide, we use the elliptic curve sec P256K1 defined over a finite field. Okay, I'm very quickly going to talk about finite fields and elliptic curves. If you're just thinking about signatures, all of this can be treated as a, as a black box. You just need to know the property that things in this black box are easy to multiply but difficult to divide. That's really all you need to know. I'm going to give you an overview to, to give you some concepts of what's going on, but really, as long as you have a system where it's easy to multiply but difficult to divide, you can build an asymmetric cryptography scheme over it and you can build digital signatures. So you could build a Schnorr signature scheme over a different group, over a different system, as long as it has those properties. Okay, finite fields. Quickly, a group in mathematics is a set, a set of objects, along with a binary operator, which we're gonna call plus here. But in general, a binary operator is just something that takes two elements from a set as inputs and as an output gives you another element of the set. That binor binary operator has these properties. One, closure. So if you take two elements and you add them, add them together, you end up with another element in the group. There's an identity element, which in addition over, over numbers as you understand them is zero. If you add zero to anything, you end up with that same element or if you add an element to zero, you end up with that same element. Every element has an inverse, which means in addition, we're talking about the negative number, but more generally, if you have an element in the group, there's another element where if you do the binary operator to them together, you end up with zero, the identity element. And then finally, associativity. So if you have three elements, A, B, and C, and you add A and B together, and then with the result you add C, you end up with the same thing as if you add A to B plus C. It doesn't matter which order you do those, those operators. And then there's another property called commutativity, and some groups have commutativity, some don't. We call groups that have commutativity commutative groups or abelian groups. And th that is, if you have A and B, A plus B equals B plus A. It doesn't matter which order. Okay, not all groups have that, some do. All right, so moving on to a cyclic group. What's a cyclic group? Well, it's cyclic if there's something called a generator element. Here we're calling it G, small g. Um, and if every element in the group is G added to, to itself some number of times, then we call that a cyclic group with G generating the group. Um, so for example, 
the integers modular modulo some number. So if we say, for example, p is um, five, then the group zero, one, two, three, four, under addition, modulo five is a group. So one plus, with one as a generator. So two equals one plus one, three equals one plus one plus one, four equals one plus one plus one plus one. And then if you add one again, you, you wrap around to zero, that's the modulo. All right, we're going pretty quickly. I'm just going to rush through this. So a field adds a bit more structure onto a group. It adds a second binary operator, which we're going to call x here, multiply. But again, this is just abstract. Um, that second operator is also closed. So if you multiply any two elements together, you end up with an element in the group. Um, it's also, it also has an identity with multiplication in the numbers. That identity is 1, because 1 times anything is itself. Every element has an inverse except for zero, and it's also associative and commutative. And the binary operators together, plus and multiply, are distributive. So if you have A multiplied by B plus C, that's the same as A multiplied by B plus A multiplied by C. So, so why am I talking about all of this? Well, it ends up that if you have these properties, you can do things that we understand with real numbers. Um, we, you can add them together, you can subtract, you can multiply, and you can divide. So that's a nice structure. We can kind of think about that as like the numbers. Examples, so the real numbers, so all numbers from you know, zero all the way up and all the way down, decimals, irrational numbers, all of those real numbers with addition and multiplication defined as you understand them normally, that's an infinite field. The rational numbers, so if you take just the rational, those are fractions, with addition and multiplication, again, defined as normal, that's another infinite field. All the integers um, from 0 to n minus 1 with addition and multiplication defined modulo n is another field, but that's finite. There's only a finite number of elements. And a very interesting field that we're going to talk about is um, fp, where p is a prime number. Um, and that is the integers modulo p. So for example, f13 is 0 through 12. And if you go beyond 12, you just wrap around. So 4 plus 5, as normal, is 9. 8 plus 9 is 17. But because we wrap around modulo 13, that's 4. Um, 4 minus 8 is minus 4. But again, we wrap around and we get 9. Uh, 5 times 3 is 2 modulo 13. 5 divided by 3 is 5 times the inverse of 3. And the inverse of 3 is 9, because 3 times 9 is 27, which equals 1 modulo 13. Um, so that's 45, which equals 6. So we have all of our kind of mathematical operators that we understand. OK, moving on. Elliptic curves. An elliptic curve is a curve of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are some constants which define the curve. Um, in Bitcoin, we use a curve called secp256k1. Sorry, I've missed out a p there. Um, and that is y squared equals x cubed plus 7. So you know, a equals 0 in this case, and b equals 7. And if you draw that curve out over the real numbers, we end up with a, a nice looking curve like this. OK, but instead of defining that curve over the reals, which is what it looks like there, we actually define it over a finite field of integers mod p, where p is this enormous number here, 2 to the 256 minus some very small terms. So instead of having a nice continuous curve like this, if we drew a graph, we'd end up with something like this. This is actually mod. 255, I think. But it doesn't look anything like that. However, the properties still hold that you can draw lines between points on this curve. I'm going to say this is a curve. And each time you draw a line between two points, you'll meet another point. So it's kind of difficult to intuit what it looks like, because it just looks like a bunch of dots on a page. But it still has some nice properties of what it would look like if it was over the reals. 
Okay, going back to what I talked about earlier, groups, we can define a group operation for points on this curve. And we define it as follows, to add two points. So if we have a point P and another point on the curve Q, to add them, we draw a line, see where it meets the curve, and then mirror it by the x-axis. So here, P plus Q equals R. That's, that's a binary operation in the group. Um, to double a point, so to add it to itself, here we're doubling P, we find the tangent of the, the curve at that point, find where it meets the curve again, and then reflect over the x-axis. And I'm gonna claim that you can do this every time you use a tangent, you'll, you'll find the curve at some other point. I'm not gonna prove that. Um, and the inverse under the, under the group operation is um, its reflection in the x-axis. If we add P plus Q together, you can see an element plus its inverse will not meet the curve again. And we call that point the point at infinity, and that's our identity element. Okay, so that's the only exception where if you have a line between two points on the curve, it won't meet the curve again. Okay, I'm gonna claim, but I'm not gonna prove that this indeed is a group operation or a, a group operator on the set of points on the, on the curve. Okay, so we got this group. How do I make a cyclic group out of it? Well, I take any point on the curve, which I call G, G for generator, and I add it to itself and I keep adding it to itself until I eventually come back to the same point. And because every point I've touched is a multiple of G, then that set of points is a cyclic group. For sec P two, five, six K one, we use this generator point, this big number. This is the X coordinate and this is the Y coordinate. And if you add that to itself multiple times, you'll get a group. And now I'm gonna claim, and again, I'm not gonna prove because we can't prove that this group, this cyclic group, it's easy to add elements to, to each other. It's easy to add an element to itself multiple times. But if, if I give you an element in this group that isn't G, and I ask you how many times do you need to add G to itself to get to that element, you're gonna find it really difficult. And the reason I claim it's difficult is because people have tried, and as far as we're aware, no one has found a way to do this efficiently. Okay, so this elliptic curve, this finite field system that I've defined for you, um, we're gonna claim it has the properties that we want, that multiplication is easy, but division is difficult. So the private key is a scalar X, which is some number, it's a scalar, in the range zero up to N minus one, where N is the order of the group. The public key, P is a point on that curve where P equals X times G. And again, multiplication is easy. So if I know X, it's very easy to find P. Yep. It's because people have tried to find an efficient way of um, finding the discrete log of a point on an elliptic curve. And as far as we're aware, no one has succeeded. That's <laughs> That's our security. Okay, so if you have X, you can very easily find P. P is a public key. But if you have P, I assert it's difficult to find X or computationally difficult. Okay, so all of that, if that, if you didn't study math at high school or university and all of that is alien to you and your head's spinning right now because you've just met groups and fields and elliptic curves for the first time, don't worry. You don't need to know any of that because you're not cryptologists. Put that in a box, seal that box up, and just know that in this box we have a system where it's easy to multiply but difficult to divide. And it doesn't matter what's in that box, we could substitute out elliptic curves for some other group, but we're gonna build on top of that one property of easy to multiply but difficult to divide. And we're gonna use a system called Schnorr. We're gonna build an application of that called Schnorr signatures. But we're gonna start with something called the Schnorr Identification Protocol. 
And this is, if I have a scalar x, which is my private key, and it corresponds to a public key p, I can prove to you that I know what x is without revealing what x is. Right? This is called a proof in zero knowledge, where I prove to you, but you learn nothing about x. Very quickly, a proof in zero knowledge is kind of weird if you've never come across it before, but it requires three properties. One is completeness, and that is that I do indeed convince you that I know what x is. Right? The second is zero knowledgeness, which is by going through this protocol, you learn nothing about x. That's the zero knowledge part of it. Right? The only thing you learn is that I know what x is. And the third property is soundness. And that is that I can only produce this proof if I do know what X is. So the Schnorr identification protocol has three steps. One, the first is a commitment. Okay, so remember, I know what X is, and you know what P is, or everyone knows what P is. And I'm trying to prove to you that I know what X is. So first of all, I pick a what we call a nonce, a random number, K. And I commit to that K by sending you big K, which is k times g. And again, if you know big k, you can't work out what little k is. So I sent you big k. You send me a challenge, and that's just a scalar e. And then I send you a response, which is s. It can be a signature. That's why it's s. But s is k plus ex. And these are all scalars. So little k is a scalar. It's just a number. E is just a number that you've challenged me with, and X is my private key. Again, just a number. So I'm sending you a number. OK. W why do we have completeness? Um, sorry, what is completeness? Completeness is that my proof will convince you. W why do I have this? Well, you'll be convinced if this identity holds SG equals KG plus EXG. Um, Little k times g is big K. That's what I committed to in step one. You already know big K. x times g, that's my private key times g, is p. That's the public key. Everyone knows that. And you as a verifier can do this because you know s. I told you s. You know g, that's a generated point of the group. That's, that's shared between everyone. You know big K because I sent that to you in step one. You know e because you sent that to me in step two. And you know my public key, because it's public. OK, so you, you'll believe me if I produce this S that satisfies that equation. Next, why is this zero knowledge? Why do you learn nothing? And I'm going to very quickly give you a sketch of, of why this is actually zero knowledge. It's quite difficult to um, read. If you haven't come across this before, it seems strange. but I'll try and convince you that you learn nothing about x from this protocol. OK, so we call the transcript of this three-step protocol KES. Right? K, K is the commitment that I sent you in step one. E is the challenge that you send back to me. And S is the proof or the signature. If someone's watching this protocol and they write down the messages that go each way, in a list, it would be k, then e, then s. So that's a transcript. Now, if you and I collude beforehand, if you, the verifier, and I want to cheat, you can tell me what e is before I commit to k. right? So you tell me step two before I've actually sent you k. We'll call this e fake. Um, I then choose s fake randomly. So I choose my signature randomly. And then I can compute a k, a big k, very easy, make big K fake equal to S fake times G minus E fake times P. Right, the transcript is then K fake, E fake, S fake. It's, it's sound, the, the identity balances, and the transcript looks exactly the same for a fake um, proof as it did for a real proof, right? So there's, there's no difference. If, you're, if there's someone who's an impar impartial a watcher from outside and they see this fake proof, they can't tell the difference between the fake proof and the real proof. So this fake proof obviously tells you nothing about X, right? Your, your simulation proof can be produced without knowledge of X. 
and your simulation proof is indistinguishable from the real proof. And so the real proof also must therefore tell you nothing about X. And the final property of a zero knowledge proof is soundness. And that is, if I am able to produce a proof, then I must know X. So if the prover can produce a proof reliable, reliably for any challenge E, then she must know X. Okay, so how do I, how do I prove this or how do I demonstrate that Schnorr identi the Schnorr identity protocol has soundness? Well, imagine if you're able to pause, fast forward or rewind what the prover is doing. Okay, the, the verifier could, quote, fork the prover. So the verifier waits for the commitment K and sends challenge E1 to the prover and receives response S1. Then we rewind, we travel back in time to the challenge step, send challenge E2 and receive response S2. Okay, so imagine your, your verifier just has this one secret power that they can go forwards and backwards in time. Um, they could do this. And the verifier now has S1 and S2. S1 equals K plus E1X. S2 equals K plus E2X. And the verifier can calculate X, the private key. So if I can move forwards and backwards in time, but do nothing else, I can work out what your private key is just by challenging you twice after the same commitment. So the verifier has extracted the private key from the prover. And if the verifier can take the private key from the prover, the prover must have already had the private key, right? I can't take something from you that you don't already have. Now, if that doesn't convince you, just imagine the prover going through this operation with himself, forking himself, and um, the prover can extract the key from himself, right? So if the prover can create this proof, this signature for any given E, he can learn his own private key, right? So he must know his own private key. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, those are some quite weird concepts, forking and, and zero knowledgeness. Um, again, you, you don't really need to know this if you're just if you're writing code or um, doing technical engineering work. But these concepts they're useful to know. Moving on, this was an interactive protocol, right? So there was a verifier and a prover. And in fact, the prover proved to the verifier that they knew X, but they didn't prove to anyone else, right? If there's a third person watching this protocol between me and a verifier, they're not convinced of anything because the verifier could be colluding with me, right? That's, that's what happens in an interactive proof. You only prove to one person. So how do we turn this into a non-interactive proof such that I can prove to the whole world at the same time that I know X. Well, we observe that the only thing that the verifier did was provide a random challenge in step two. If you remember, step one was the prover committing to a big K, and step two was the verifier sending a challenge E. The only thing the verifier did was, was give a random number, essentially. So if we can replace that verifier, and instead of having a person there have in quotes, a random oracle that simply gives us a random number, then we can do away with a verifier. And we kind of maybe cheat a bit or, or hash things up a bit. We use a hash function as a random variable. And we claim that a hash function, if we put give an input, it will be a random oracle. It will give us a random output. And here, the word after is very important. Right, after has a special meaning. And that is that the prover can't know the output of a hash function before they know the input. If they could do that, then they could cheat, just like colluding with the verifier. So after is, is sequentially after. And this, this change from an interactive to a non-interactive proof is called a fiat Shamir transform after the, the people who created it. Okay, so what does that look like? Now the identification protocol has three steps as before. So the prover picks, picks this nonce K, this number used once. 
Um, the prover calculates E, which is a hash of big K, right? So in, um, in Bitcoin, we're going to use SHA-256, for example, but any hash function where we can't predict what the output will be given the input, we use that. And then the prover computes a scalar S equals K plus EX. So again, this is exactly the same as what happened before, except that our E here is not provided by an external verifier. It is created by this, quote, random oracle, which is a hash function. And the proof now is S E, right? The, the prover needs to give S as before, but also give E. And then anyone can verify once again by checking that SG equals KG plus EXG. Um, so this is the same as before, the same identity. Any questions about that? Yes. Correct. Um, So, sorry, can you say that again? That's a good question. Can I come back to that later? But sure. yeah. Yeah. You could you could share the big K. Yeah. Big K is known. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so this was that was a non-interactive identity protocol. Um, you proved to any observer that you know what X is without revealing X. You can now extend this to create a signature over a message. And since H is this random oracle, it's a hash function, and it returns different values for whatever input you put into it, you can add extra inputs to that H. And the result is what we call a signature of knowledge over that message. So we just pick and we set E equals H of the message concatenated with K, big K. Um, and we could call this H prime, right? This is, this is a different hash function that takes as an input big K, right? If we just say H prime equals H of M concatenate K, it's a hash function. And the prover calculates S in a normal way. The verifier then checks that um, the identity holds and that E is indeed this hash of M concatenate K. What does that do? Oh, sorry. Um, that seals the message into the signature. So once that signature is produced, you can't change the message afterwards without knowing the private key X. 
that gives you message in integrity. And that is a Schnorr signature. It's just the same, the Schnorr identity, but somehow putting a message into that hash function. And usually that, that message will be a hash of whatever you want to sign over. All right, ECDSA. I'm going to go over this very quickly. I'm just going to give the, um, the identities and the formula. It's a different digital signature algorithm. It's, it also uses the discrete log problem over elliptic curves, just like Schnorr. And it was developed and, and then used in Bitcoin because Schnorr signatures, that scheme was encumbered by a patent. There are quite a few disadvantages compared to Schnorr. Signatures are not linear. Okay, and with linear signatures, we can do really nice things like threshold signatures and adapter signatures, script with scripts. You can have similar concepts in ECDSA, but they're a lot more difficult. There's no formal security proof for ECDSA. So that zero knowledge proof or the zero knowledge demonstration that I talked about earlier does not exist for ECDSA and ECDSA signatures are malleable. So there's a lot of reasons why we would prefer to use Schnorr signatures and maybe in the future, Bitcoin will allow Schnorr signatures. So in signing the prover, signs a message M as follows. He has it, hashes M onto a field element. So hash N and then take the leftmost bits. He then picks a random non scalar K as before sets big K to K times G and R to the X coordinate of K. So K is a point on the curve. You just pick the X coordinate and then set S as the inverse of K, little K, um, times Z plus RX. And the signature is a pair RS. To verify, again, the verifier Calculate Z in the same way, set Z to the leftmost bits of HM, and then sets U to Z times the inverse of S, and set V to R times the inverse of S. And now if the X coordinate of U times G plus V times P is equal to R, then the signature is valid. So it's similar in some ways to Schnorr, but um, made just different enough to not be in encumbered by that patent. That's all I had. Um, I'm going to point you in the direction of some further reading because there are a lot of concepts there and they're kind of difficult to absorb. But I think that this paper, The Borromean Ring Signatures by Greg Maxwell and Andrew Polstra, explains Schnorr signatures in a really nice way. Um, if you sit down and read the first few sections of that, um, it gives a very good, concise overview of how the Schnorr identity protocol and Schnorr signatures work. Anything by Adam Gibson is, is fantastic. He's written papers on confidential transactions and bulletproofs, so those are quite advanced topics. But the, again, if you just read the first few se sections of those papers, they give excellent introductions to signing and zero knowledge. Um, Matthew Green has a good blog post on zero knowledge proofs. And then if you want to know more about Schnorr signatures and advanced scripts, then the video by Peter Wooler at the San Francisco Bitcoin devs um, from a couple of months ago is really good. All right, um, that's, that's all I had. Were there any questions on any of that? Okay, thank you. The patent expired in 2008. Um, Bitcoin, the first version came out in 2009 and Satoshi used um, a library that didn't have Schnorr. ECDSA was better understood at that time, so it, it made sense to use ECDSA. Uh, 
the question was, are there any other features of Schnorr signatures um, that we don't have with ECDSA that would be good for Bitcoin? Yes, lots. And they mostly stem from um, this property here that Schnorr signatures are linear. So you can make multi-sig NFN signatures in Schnorr. So say, for example, three out of three people sign. That would look just like a single signature, and that's very easy to do in Schnorr. You can make threshold signatures, for example, two out of three signing. Again, look like a, a single signature. It's a bit more difficult, but it's it's easy, or easier in Schnorr. You can also have things called script with scripts or adapter signatures where you add commitments into a signature. Um, again, easy with Schnorr, very difficult with ECDSA. Uh, you can do things like signature aggregation across different inputs in a transaction or indeed across transactions within a block with Schnorr. That's, that would require quite a big change in terms of the way we structure things, but that would be possible. Again, not possible with ECDSA. Um, another advantage is an implementation detail that ECDSA signatures in Bitcoin require usually 71 or 72 bytes. That's not a property of ECDSA, it's just a property of the way that we encode them. If we're starting from scratch with Schnorr, we can make signatures 64 bytes with the same security level. So, yeah, lots and lots of advantages. Would it require a hard fork? No, it, it could be done with a soft fork. And that takes advantage of the way that SegWit was implemented, that we now have versioning for scripts. And so we could just add a new version of script that includes Schnorr signatures, and that's a soft fork. Any other questions? All right, thank you.